Our street is happy to bring together this panel of policy experts to discuss the conservative case for surveillance reform. And we're pretty excited because it's being live streamed from our friends at Cato, which brings up the great joke that for my mom and the one NSA analyst who is watching right now, thanks. Um, two years ago, major revelations about the NSA's massive intrusion into the lives of all Americans jump-started a national debate about the right to privacy and questions of government intrusion into our personal lives. With key sections of the Patriot Act set to expire within seven weeks, Congress must address the constitutionality and the effectiveness of the NSA's mass surveillance programs. And so today to discuss this, um, this issue um, and, and the, the timeliness of this issue, we have a great little panel here. And so I'm going to do a brief introductions of who we have on the panel, then I'm going to let them uh, introduce themselves to you with opening statements. First, we have on my left um, Mike Godwin, who is our Director of Innovation Policy for the R Street Institute. Mike uh, leads the R Street Institute's research and advocacy efforts on technology policy. Previously, he served as a senior policy advisor at Internews, advising the organization's public policy partners in developing and transitional democracies. Before then, he worked as general counsel for Wikimedia Foundation, doing a lot of work regarding around the SOPA PIPA battles that we saw a couple years ago. Godwin began his legal career as the first staff counsel for the Electronic Future Foundation, Frontier Foundation, Frontier Foundation thank you, um, which he advised on a range of legal issues during the accelerating growth of internet access in the United States. You may also have heard of his contribution to the internet. He is the author of Godwin's Law, which states and follows, as an online discussion grows longer, the probability of a comparison involving Nazis or Hitler approaches one. <laughs> and as many of you Hill staffers know, that basically sounds like your boss's Facebook pages um, or Twitter accounts, not your boss, but the comments afterwards. Um, anyway, I think he's actually a great example of what we need to do in this conversation, which is not use hyperbole and look for kind of scare tactics, but actually have a rational debate and discussion about the issues at hand. So we're happy to have Mike here. Um, next to Mike, we have um, Sunday Yukabatis, who is the president of Golden Frog. Sunday has served as the president of Golden Frog since its inception in 2009. Golden Frog is an internet and privacy company. He's based out of Austin, but they are actually a Swiss company. Um, and it's kind of a good conversation piece to talk about why they're in Switzerland and not in the US, because it involves a lot of the privacy concerns the tech, com tech community is facing these days. Since 2007, he has served as president and prior to that role, he was a patent litigator in San Francisco. Um, Yucubatis holds an electronic engineering degree from Rice University and a JD from the University of Houston. On my right is Wayne Bro, of um, the chief economist and vice president of the research at, at FreedomWorks. He receives his PhD in economics from George Mason University. Um, Wayne previously worked at the Office of Management and Budget, focusing on transportation regulations, the USA Agency for International Development, focusing on market reforms in Africa and in research branch of an investment bank where he covered US domestic policies. He has testified before Congress regularly and we're really happy to have him, so thank you, Wayne. And then finally, last but not least, I've gotten to know Patrick recently. Patrick Eddington is a policy analyst at the Cato Institute. Patrick, um, before working in at Cato, he spent 10 years with Representative Rush Holt of New Jersey, working specifically on major surveillance issues, and uh, we're happy to have him. But before then, he spent 10 years actually with the CIA, um, National Photographic Interpretation Center. So he's actually been on the front lines of a lot of the surveillance issues that we're going to be discussing today and has a really unique perspective that we're really happy to have. So without further ado, um, Mike, why don't you start us off and just give opening statements? see everybody's eyes, and this, this is my only opportunity to actually see everybody, otherwise we're sort of buried. Um, so I, I worked, I was in Africa in June of 2013. I was visiting uh, NGOs and talking to government officials in Nigeria and in South Sudan, and I was working on internet policy and talking to them about what internet policy maybe should look like in, in these countries. and. Uh, at the time, it had been revealed that now, now ex-president, but the then president Jonathan, uh, good luck Jonathan in Nigeria, had funded massive surveillance. He'd already set out to fund a build out of massive surveillance infrastructure in Nigeria. And in South Sudan, 
they really hadn't thought about internet policy yet, but the government sort of knew, people in government sort of knew they wanted to monitor. And so we, I would talk about what the limits of that were, but this was in June of 2013. So while I was there, of course, the Edward Snowden story broke. And uh, people would come up to me and they'd say, so you're from the United States and you're here talking about limits on surveillance, but you guys do a lot of it and now we know, you know, now we know just sort of the extent of it. And I said, well, look, those of us who've worked on surveillance issues for a long time, and I've worked on them for 25 years, and the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act goes back to 78, and the Wiretap Act even goes back to the 1960s. So it's been around for a long time. We've known the theoretical scope under the law, even prior to uh, the Patriot Act, what the scope of the law was. And it was broad. But what we now know, because of these stories, is the scope of digital surveillance, which is hugely broad and practically uh, without limit. And now, uh, in the United States, we're having a public debate about it. So you guys, in your country, where is your public debate? Well, I was kind of blithe about it because I thought we were going to have a public debate that was going to lead to reform, but it hasn't happened yet. Uh, and the question is, why hasn't it happened? And I think for part of it is that there's a tension uh, in other political sectors as well, but certainly within conservative uh, political circles between commitment to national security and commitment to limited government. Well, these notions are in some tension. Because it used to be the case that before the digital, digital age, if you wanted to have privacy in your phone calls or conversations, you only needed to walk down the road away from the people who were listening to you. But now, by default, you leave footprints all over the place, you leave records. Uh, anybody who has your call records knows a whole lot about you and maybe doesn't even need the content of your conversations. Um, it's all true, you know, and, and, and the difficulty here in justifying a straight up uh, reauthorization of Section 215, which could happen in seven weeks, the difficulty is that we can't really justify Section 215 surveillance based on effectiveness. There's no terror plots that we know of that were really stopped. There's no crimes that we know of that were really stopped. What we know is really this. Once governments and government agencies become addicted to bulk surveillance, it's like addiction to crack. They had it, they want more of it, they can't make themselves stop using it, even if there's no good reason to be doing it. So we are now, in this Congress, uh, we now have an opportunity to make meaningful uh, reform as Section 215 is up for review. And the question, I think, before us is what that reform looks like. And we may all disagree about what the prescriptions are. We may, some of us, disagree. But here's what we, we don't disagree that there is a sickness. That governments, our government, like every government, it must be said, once they get used to surveillance, they find it really, really hard to give it up. And they'll justify it and they'll say anything to keep it. We will do our country a disservice if we get to the end of this period and we just reauthorize and we just wait until the last 48 hours or 24 hours and we vote to reauthorize. We have a chance to start this conversation. It is a conversation that reaches to conservative values and we need to have that conversation right now. Thanks. Mike. So my name is uh, Sunday Yokobitis. I'm president of Golden Frog, and, and Golden Frog is an internet privacy and security firm. So one of the reasons Golden Frogs exist is because of the NSA. Uh, we started Golden Frog in 2009 as a response to seeing the disclosures that the NSA was tapping AT&T's fiber lines in San Francisco uh, in, that, in the closet there, as it's, as it's called. So we saw that. We filed some papers with the FCC. No one listened. And so we decided to start a company, um, don't get mad, get even, and build some products to protect consumers online. So we've been doing that since 2009, well in advance of the Snowden um, revelations. So really our flagship product is called Viper VPN. It's a personal VPN. So we're encrypting internet connections with virtually uh, 
in every country in the world, we've got customers now. So it's really exploded and the use of encryption has exploded. So really the, some of the foundations of why Golden Frog exists is, is a response to what the NSA was doing, you know, much uh, prior to uh, some of the Snowden disclosures. So I really want to, you know, leave you with three things. I'm going to kind of reserve some of that and, and get through the intro pretty quickly. But I want to leave you guys with three things that mass surveillance by the NSA is definitely bad for civil liberties. It's bad um, for us personally, but there's a business impact. It's costing us jobs. It's costing us business. Business is going offshore. There's a, there's a giant sucking sound of servers leaving the United States, and that con is continuing. So, you know, my dad always tells me that bad news travels like wildfire, and good news takes months and years. And so we have this situation where this news is just spread, and people, we've lost some of our leadership and our trust, and it's having a business impact. Um, we can talk about whether the average American cares about these issues, but there's a business impact that I would like to get across everyone in this room and talk a little more about today. The second thing is, it's related to the NSA, um, but I want to talk and explain to you why encryption is the Second Amendment for the Internet. Um, I'm a Texan, so that means that I own no shortage of two shotguns, a deer rifle, a couple handguns, and a, and a archery bow that shoots 300 feet per second. So I, and I work in an encryption company, so I don't think there's anyone in a better position to explain to you why encryption is the Second Amendment for the Internet and is something that we must protect. Uh, and also, as the third thing I want to leave you guys with, um, there's been talk from the FBI director of having back doors for encryption, and I want to talk to you and explain why that is just an awful, terrible idea. If you see that, you should shudder. Uh, I'll explain why um, here later, but those are really the three things I want to get across today. Thank you. Great, thanks. Uh, I'm Wayne Brow, the chief economist at, at FreedomWorks, and um, as I'm sure a lot of you know, we're a, uh, a grassroots organization with, with, uh, with including our Facebook reach, probably about six million people that we represent. And to them, you know, and to FreedomWorks as an organization, um, this is a very conservative, you know, limited government issue. Um, from our perspective, and let me, I'll just go through three things real quickly here. Um, and the first is, is that the Fourth Amendment doesn't stop at technology's door. The, con the founders created a constitution with protect protections against government intrusions into our lives, and that should exist no matter where, we're, where our lives are carrying us. And more and more of that is online. And I think those protections have to be uh, included in our, in our activities, uh, in our daily lives, and, and, and uh, in our, our uh, internet lives. Um, the second thing uh, I'll, I'll talk about is with respect to that, um, we, along with uh, Rand Paul, have filed a, a lawsuit uh, against uh, the, the bulk data collection. Um, it's sort of turning along right now. Um, but this is, this is an important issue for us, and we, we have uh, you know, filed a suit where I think we're, we're still going back and forth. Uh, uh, I think the administration challenged our standing, but that's still being worked out. Um, but it's important enough that, that we are, are, are going to the courts to try and stop this. Um, and the second reason that, that we, we look at the, this as, as an important issue for those who support limited government is if you look at the economics of it, you know, the, the results of bulk data collection are not that good. And I think it's been mentioned before that um, you can't point to a lot of effective, uh, uh, you know, plots that have been uh, resolved using bulk data collection. And I can get into some of the reasons why uh, it, it's a knowledge problem, something that Hayek talked about in a different way, but I think it applies here as well. Um, and then finally, it, it's just bad economics, and, and there's two reasons for the bad economics. One is more and more of our businesses are moving to the cloud, and the U.S. has been a, a leader in this area in a lot of ways. But as these, these revelations came out, um, it, it turns out that foreign companies and foreign governments don't like us looking at their data. So um, when we're starting to collect data on, on, on others across the borders, it makes them less skeptical or more skeptical about using U.S. products and, and building a U.S. cloud. So we now have competitors in Europe building clouds that, that compete with us and China and, and you know, other parts of the world. And you know, in terms of uh, intelligence and, and uh, you know, security, uh, those guys are probably not up and up on what they're doing as well. So, so we're in, in a way, we're driving business away from us in a ways that hurts the economy and also maybe uh, weaken some of our, our security questions. And the other side of the economics that, that, that it's a challenge because of these, the, the revelation of these programs is it leads to a potential to fragment the internet. Um, more and more governments are seeing this, well, you know, this, 
you know, the U.S. has had such a dominant role in the creation of the Internet, and now we're finding out all these things that they've been doing to the Internet. Maybe we should start uh, re rejiggering our Internet. And you've seen, ov obviously, China, for other reasons, has, has been out on its own. But now you see other countries, you know, um, you know Brazil is, is, is very out vocal against what the U.S. is doing. But in a lot of ways, uh, and we can talk about this later, but, but between the, the economics of using the cloud and the dangers to a, to a fragmented Internet, there, there's real economic arguments against going down this path. <clears throat> well, my thanks to Nathan Lemer and our friends at uh, R Street, and, and a very special shout out to the Cato Communications team for uh, making sure that uh, this, this word here gets out to anybody and everybody who's interested. Uh, as Nathan indicated, I'm a former CIA military analyst, and I've actually used NSA products um, in wartime, uh, going back to Desert Shield and Desert Storm in 1991, and then again uh, in the Balkan campaign, uh, Deliberate Force and Dead Eye in 1995. When I worked for Congressman Holt, I was also his detailee to the National Commission on Research and Development in the U.S. intelligence community, and of course I spent 10 years up here working for him. So I know both the intelligence business and the intelligence oversight business. And there's one other really quick point that I want to make uh, right at the top here, and that is that neither I nor any of my fellow panelists would ever ask you or your members to support a solution to the problem that we're discussing today that would increase the risk to the lives of people here at home or our deployed troops abroad. We all recognize the threats that our country faces today are real. But that also means that in responding to those threats, we need to make sure that our actions don't destroy the very thing that makes our nation the greatest on earth, and that's our Constitution and our Bill of Rights. Now, you know, when I got home last night, I thought my talking points were in good order and yada, 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 until I got an email uh, from one of my friends in the civil liberties community pointing me to this USA Today story that broke yesterday which revealed DEA mass surveillance on Americans going back to 1992. It's one of your, yeah, and, and he's, got a, he's got a copy up here, thank you. Um, it's one of the handouts uh, out front, uh, and I hope if uh, you didn't get a chance to pick one up, you will on your way out. Now, I wanna take a, a couple of seconds here to quote just two of the passages from that story, because I think they're just incredibly important. For more than two decades, the Justice Department and the Drug Enforcement Administration amassed logs of virtually all telephone calls from the United States to as many as 116 countries linked to drug trafficking, current and former officials involved with the operation said. The targeted countries changed over time but included Canada, Mexico, and most of Central and South America. The now discontinued operation carried out by the DEA's intelligence arm was the government's first known effort to gather data on Americans in bulk, sweeping up records of telephone calls made by millions of U.S. citizens, regardless of whether they were suspected of a crime. It was a model for the massive telephone surveillance system that the NSA launched to identify terrorists after the September 11th attacks. So we now know that for the last 20 plus years, the American public has been subjected to secret warrantless mass surveillance in addition to the kinds of mass surveillance authorized by laws passed in the open here in Congress. The question before us is, so what do we do about it? Well, very soon your bosses are gonna have an opportunity to do something about it. On or before the 21st of May, your bosses will be asked to vote on whether to continue the three Patriot Act provisions that are set to expire June 1st. May 21st is the real deadline because everybody's out for the district work period after that. Um, to refresh your memory, one part of that program collects all telephone data like your number, the numbers of the people you call, the duration, time, et cetera. This is the telephone metadata program. And that current metadata program captures every call by every American. So if you're a gun owner like me, and for the record, my weapon of choice is a Glock 2145 ACP. Um, it's my personal sidearm. I'm, I'm into big bore, what can I say? Uh, it means they know which range I called, to verify whether or not they're open so I can go shoot, whether I've called others um, 
about the same range, whether I'm a member of a gun rights organization or a sports shooting club. That's one reason, by, uh, why the, uh, by the way, that the NRA filed an amicus brief with the ACLU's lawsuit back in 2013. And if you all want to see a copy of that amicus, just let me know. My business cards are here. And on one of the handouts, I've got my contact information as well. Now, one, one U.S. District Court judge has already ruled this, con this uh, particular program unconstitutional, and that was Judge Richard Leon um, back in December of 2013. And I want to read you just one paragraph from his opinion. I cannot imagine a more indiscriminate and arbitrary invasion that this systematic and high-tech collection and retention of personal data on virtually every single citizen for purposes of querying and analyzing it without prior judicial approval. Surely such a program infringes on that degree of privacy that the founders enshrined in the Fourth Amendment. Indeed, I have little doubt that the author of our Constitution, James Madison, who cautioned us to beware, quote, the abridgment of freedom of the people by gradual and silent encroachments by those in power, end quote, would be aghast. That's about as far from the Fourth Amendment's individual probable cause-based warrant standard as you can get. And I think it's worth noting that in pre-revolutionary America, they called such things general warrants or writs of assistance, and they were a major factor in the fueling of the American Revolution. But Section 215 also allows the government to go much farther in terms of getting records that relate to you. All they have to do is claim that their request is connected to the collection of, quote, foreign intelligence information, end quote. This includes, but is not limited to, firearm sales records, the list of books you've checked out of the library, your Amazon.com purchase history, and so on. So if you've ordered books on Al-Qaeda or ISIS, or checked them out of your local library, the government has direct access to that data under Section 215. And we know from documents in the Snowden archive that just using privacy technology, like encrypted emails or VPN, or anonymous browsing technology like Tor will get you targeted by the NSA for collection. No warrant, no judicial proceeding involved. You'll hear more about this, I'm sure, in the course of the discussion uh, for the balance of the afternoon. But you should also be aware, and this is really important for purposes of your bosses actually making a decision going forward, you should also be aware that a congressionally mandated report on Section 215 compliance remains classified. The DOJ Inspector General waited for months to DO, for DOJ itself to complete a declassification review, but they got tired of waiting and they finally sent the classified version over to the House and the Senate. So if your bosses have the opportunity, they should absolutely go and request to see that compliance report and every other compliance report that has been filed prior to casting any vote related to surveillance-related acti uh, activities. And if someone tries to tell you that these surveillance programs have not been violated, their powers have not been abused, that's not what FISA court judge Reggie Walton said when he called out NSA and DOJ for lying to him, and I use those words advisedly, lying to him, in their declarations about Section 215. The NSA's own inspector general has issued reports on NSA analysts using NSA surveillance capabilities to monitor ex-spouses or ex-boyfriends or girlfriends. And I've got the letter uh, on that that Senator Grassley uh, sent over to NSA, and he's still going back and forth with them on that. But I do have that response if anybody wants to look at that. Now, why, why should we be concerned about this? Well, you have the circumstance where we have this person by the name of Lois Lerner. I think everybody here has probably heard of that person. Misusing her position at the IRS to go after conservative groups. We now have the Secret Service trying to intimidate the chairman of the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee, Mr. Chaffetz. He applied for a job there. As you may have noticed, the Secret Service hasn't exactly been doing a stellar job lately, and Mr. Chaffetz is trying to change that. And they're going after him by taking personal information and trying to put it out there. And if you think that these kinds of acts aren't meant to intimidate, think again. There's a long and very dishonorable history of government officials through multiple administrations going all the way back to FDR, utilizing the power of the government to intimidate individuals. This debate also gives your bosses a chance to consider what a real NSA reform proposal will look like. And to help you out with that, another one of the handouts that I have is a checklist of items that any real reform proposal should actually include. 
And it's a way for you and your bosses to evaluate any legislation, whether it's the Surveillance State Repeal Act that's been introduced by Mr. Pokin and Mr. Massey, which is hands down the strongest reform proposal ever introduced on this topic, or any other proposal that happens to come down the pike. And so I want to cut myself off here so we have a chance to get into questions and Q&A and all the rest of that, but I'll just leave you with this. 33 days after my 18th birthday, I raised my right hand and I took an oath to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, all enemies, foreign and domestic. I've taken that oath four times in my life. And next to the oath that I took to my wife, it's the only oath that's ever mattered to me. You took the same oath. We all need to bear that in mind as we go forward in this debate. As Mr. Franklin said, Anyone who would trade their liberty for, I'll paraphrase here, the illusion of security ultimately deserves neither. Thank you. What's been exciting for me um, in this discussion is that I've read a lot of articles. I've worked in a Hill office um, working on some of these issues, then working from some advocacy groups on this as well. And I've never had the opportunity to ask questions of four experts. I've usually gotten stuck in Reddit conversations that go on and on, or 2 a.m. dorm room conversations that just never get anywhere. So I'm pretty excited to ask these questions. I think over the past 15 minutes or so, these guys have done a great job of kind of laying out the basics. So I'm gonna dig in a little bit further on what you guys have said by asking some questions. Um, the first question that I have is you kind of all dance around it, but I kind of want to know why. Why should conservatives actually unite to restore constitutional privacy protection? You know, we, we, there's been a huge focus for the last month over executive overreach and quote unquote executive amnesty and questions about, um, further questions about various uh, individuals in, in the executive branch who have, may have overstepped their bounds. But we don't see that same rigorous debate and uni uni unity among conservatives over NSA surveillance invasion of our privacy. Could, why should conservatives here and the rest of the halls of Congress be united on this issue? If you could, if one of you guys could answer or give a couple of thoughts on that. Well, I, I can talk about through why. I mean, I, like I said before, um, it's costing us jobs. So here's some examples, you know, um, you know, foreign companies are saying we don't want Cisco hardware in our, in our uh, devices. They're uh, ripping, uh, you know, American technology going forward because of the mistrust. Now, whether it's actually happening, there is a lot of mistrust and that's affecting us. So we're having, what, is ter what has been a huge advantage for us has now become a liability uh, because our, so a lot of our services are so pervasive in the hardware and the internet services. So that's, that's happening today. You also have consumers saying, and we see this in our business and impacting us, uh, you know, we have servers in the United States and have some people in the United States, we are a Swiss company, saying, I don't want to do business with an American company, can I get a VPN for someone in Europe? You know, so that's impacting us as well. Also, I see, um, you know, folks I know in Europe and other places, you know, cloud providers that run servers and gear and infrastructure are saying, they come and tap me on the shoulder and they say, thank you, thank you for the business. And so, what we, that's some of the why, and I, I think some of the other panels say how we do it, but I think what we need really is a balance, right? We've had, too much news, and this is just the latest example right here, just coming out today. We've had two minute, a, a drumbeat of dis, more disclosures, more news, and we need something going the other direction because it's going to take a while to turn some of this around from a business perspective because it's really, um, you know, civil liberties are, are a huge reason, um, but I'm, I'm here today to really talk about the economic impact and, and hammer that home. Um, you know, even as a company, we incorporated in Switzerland. Why is that? Um, better uh, data protection for our customers. Our customers want, want, want the data to be in Switzerland. So, you know, we have a company that's, you know, has conceived by Texans, it's forming, going offshore, why is that? So we need to turn some of that around and be, um, you know, keep our lead. Otherwise we're, I think as a country, are we starting to look, as we balance national security with economic interests, are we starting to look more like China? Are we starting, are we going that direction or should we be heading to what more Germany's doing and they're pushing end to end encryption and pushing privacy and, and talking about privacy and, as a selling point for people to locate their, their servers and businesses there? 
where are we headed? And I would like us to not be heading towards uh, the China example and be heading the other direction um, as we go forward and get some of this reform in, get something in and start heading uh, the other direction. I mean, I, I think most everybody in this room kind of knows why there's a tension there, right? I mean, any reform proposal that's been put forward so far has basically, uh, if it's been attacked, it's been attacked as, quote, weakening American national security. So the first thing that I think everybody, whether you're a conservative, whether you're a libertarian, whether you're a progressive, whether you are not politically affiliated, the first thing we have to get past is this idea that cleaning up this problem makes us weaker. You know, our, our founders gave us the Fourth Amendment, and they did not include, by the way, a national security exception in there. And they face some really big threats to include a continued British threat, which materialized in the War of 1812, threat from Native American tribes, um, a, a Spanish imperial presence on the borders, a French imperial presence on the borders. And that, that still did not cause us, even when we went through creating the Constitution uh, after the Articles of Confederation, uh, from, from changing any of that. So I think that's the first thing that folks have to get past. Secondly, and I'll go back to the efficacy argument, you know, when, when the Snowden revelations first came out, within literally hours at most days after that, you began to hear this thing along the lines of disrupted 54 plots, disrupted 54 plots. The problem was that was a lie. Um, that was refuted by the Senate Judiciary Committee. It was refuted by multiple news organizations. When they were actually pressed on it, they had to admit that not a single terrorist plot against this country had been disrupted by any Section 215 authority. So, you know, we have to deal in facts when we start talking about how we do policy here. And, and I, I don't criticize any member, you know, who's still here or who's even left Congress who voted for the Patriot Act to begin with in 2001. Because if they hadn't, they wouldn't have been in Congress in 2003. That, that's just political reality. But this is 2015. And we've now been living under a de facto surveillance state, according to the latest reporting we have, for, for two decades. That is not what the founders intended. That does not strengthen this country. It weakens it. And it, and it weakens the very foundations of our democracy. And, and that's why conservatives and libertarians and others, all Americans of goodwill on this, need to embrace that, that kind of change. I just wanted to add very briefly, the way you phrase the question is, you know, why should conservatives be, uh, and I think the, it's why shouldn't they? Because I mean, if you go back to the history of the Patriot Act, it wasn't a slam dunk. It was a very, very controversial bill. And it wasn't uh, what most conservatives th saw as, as the right thing to do. I mean, we still go out to, you know, we have grassroots meetings all over the country and we still get tarred with, with uh, that. Um, at the time, our, we had a chairman who's a former member of Congress who voted for it. And every single time we went to an event, and I was with them, somebody came up to him and said, why did you vote for that act? I mean, it, it, so I, I think it's not something that's against conservatism. I think this is a very reasonable conservative question is, why are we doing this? Uh, that's very helpful. Um, I'm going to jump to a question that is a little out of order of my thought. It was me a order. But Sunday, you talk about um, encryption being the Second Amendment to, of the Internet, and, and Patrick mentioned earlier how Second Amendment rights advocates and activists and just law-abiding gun owners should be concerned about NSA surveillance, and so it's, there's a lot of gun efforts, there's a lot of religious groups that have been talking about concerns about um, government surveillance, um, and it's a major concern to a lot of people. Um, but could you go back Sunday and talk a little bit about what you mean when you say the Second Amendment of the Internet and how that works? Sure, well, to maybe I can step back a little bit and just explain what encryption is. Encryption really is just any means necessary to protect your data. So you could be passing a note in middle school to your boyfriend or girlfriend and having codes in there, that's encryption. You're, you're finding a way to protect your data. Uh, American Revolution used as well um, and, and during, during the, the battles there and, and, and used in a more modern context. So the encryption didn't just start with the internet, it didn't start recently. It's been there for a long time and we're all using it. So that's what really encryption means. But why encryption is the second amendment for the internet is, you know, encryption is used to protect yourself uh, online. It's, it's, it's protection, but it's also um, an expression of your ability to protect your, your expectation of privacy as well. And so it's not just use encryption to protect yourself from the government, but it's also used to protect yourself from third parties 
and hackers or other you know other people that don't have your your interest in, in mind. So there is an analogy really to it's the right to to protect yourself online. And so any I want people to to think about that because any erosion of your right to do to have encryption is your erosion of your right to protect yourself and your privacy. So that's what I mean when um, when I talk about the Second Amendment. And, and I yes, I absolutely. I, I, I just want to follow up on that a little bit because, uh, 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 as Sunday pointed out, uh, you know, the FBI has been calling for backdoors to encryption schemes. They're very public about it. And my, it's a little perverse of me, but I love it when the FBI does this because it's so crazy. <laughs> and I, I always want the other side to make crazy demands because they look, they makes them look crazy. Hence the Godwin's law. <laughs> <laughs> it makes them look crazy. And the fact is, uh, the tools that, uh, the, the encryption tools that we're talking about are not expensive. They're not, they're, the technologies are well understood. They're, they, they, it is possible to make your communications very, very secure with tools that you can buy or services that you can buy you know, turnkey, right out of the box. Uh, so when, what the government's really trying to do, what the FBI in particular is really trying to do, is roll back something that we already have the right to. Well, and, and you talk about the back doors. I want to follow on that. I mean, why, why, why can't we allow back doors? Because it's inherently insecure. Um, you know, the back door, if the government has the back door, guess who's going to want to go through there? It's going to be you know, Russian hackers, the things we see in the news, it's, you're going to create, uh, cryptography is hard enough without creating a back door. Um, it's, it's virtually, you know, I think you're right, it is an impossible demand in a lot of ways, but when you hear that talk, it's, uh, it's, you're gonna create a situation where it's insecure for all of us, so um, that's really the reason why. Seven weeks from now, the Patriot Act reauthorization is due. Uh, otherwise, it's going to sunset. Um, and over the past two years, I'm going to run through a couple uh, things that have happened over the past two years that Congress has tried to address NSA surveillance. Um, starting out in July, uh, Representative Justin Amash uh, and Co Representative Conyers introduced an amendment that would have ended the indiscriminate collection of these records. The amendment limits would have limited the government's collection of records under Section 215 of the Patriot Act to those records that pertain to a person who is subject to an investigation under the provision. Um, while the vote fell short, 205 to 217, it set the stage for a real Congress, congressional debate and a debate nationally. A number of members who voted against the bill then went, uh, went home talking about how they probably would change their vote if they could do it over again. And there was a vigorous discussion where Republicans and Democrats were working together to actually have a real vibrant defense of the Fourth Amendment, to quote my favorite representative from Texas, and that's the way it is. Um, moving on from there, while it didn't pass, it set the stage for another legislative fight over the Representative Massey Lofgren Amendment to the Defense Appropriations in 2014. This amendment would have blocked the NSA from using any of its funding from the Defense Appropriations Bill to conduct such warrantless searches. In addition, the amendment would prohibit the NSA from using its budget to mandate or request that private companies and organizations add back doors to the encryption standards. This amendment passed 293 to 123 with one abstention, one uh, present. Taken, this was, although it was taken out of con, uh, conference committee, it did set an example of what real reform should look like, and it put a lot of members on the record for pushing for real reform. There was also, and I'll continue on here with a kind of more summary of what's happened. The USA Freedom Act, originally introduced by Representative Sensenbrenner, had 150, I want to say 152 co sponsors. Unfortunately, during the Judiciary Committee process and the um, kind of the interworkings of the intelligence committees, um, it was weakened significantly. Um, and unfortunately, it may have passed, but it didn't actually achieve the reforms that we were hoping to, to actually have. Out of the 152 originally co-sponsors, 76 voted against the bill because it didn't go far enough, because they put their name on it and it didn't accomplish, it was just in name only. Like a rhino, you might say. Um, the battle wasn't quite over yet because Senator Leahy took up a better version of that, not the best version, but a better version of that and brought it into the Senate and it failed to pass muster with uh, failing to pass cloture 58 to 42 votes. You see in the 113th Congress a really big conversation about NSA surveillance reform and nothing really actually got done, but there's a lot of movement and a lot of people putting on the record and voting on it. 
With the vote upcoming and with the Surveillance State Repeal Act from Pocan and Massey on the table, which sets a really good template for what we should look at, what should uh, members of Congress, what should Congress be actually looking for? What, what, are, what are some lists of amendments and reforms that, you know, Patrick, you've put together, Wayne and others, I'd love you guys all chime in on what you guys are hoping to see out of this, uh, out of this next legislative battle. Yeah, let me, um, let me just kind of talk about this briefly here. Um, when, when you sit back and you, and you begin to kind of evaluate what you may be faced with over the course of the next, you know, five or six weeks, and as I said, I'd, I would be surprised if, if this wasn't the scenario. Um, we know that Senator Grassley is working on some kind of Section 215 related bill. I tend to doubt that it's going to do what needs to be done here, but things are happening. What I think is the most likely scenario is that you and your bosses are going to get jammed up on May 20th or May 21st. Leadership is going to come and say, we've been working on this, here it is, um, pass this or people are going to die. Okay. That's, that's, that's been the model, that, that's been how they've approached an awful lot of these issues. Would not shock me at all if that's exactly how they tried to play it here, which is why it's important for your bosses, when you all come back in next week, to start going to the speaker and to the majority leader and to Mr. Nunez uh, and to Mr. Goodlatte and saying, don't even think about it. We want to have a real debate. We want to have a real opportunity to actually, you know, take a look at any legislative language, no martial law type nonsense, none of that stuff. Really have the opportunity to take a look at this stuff and, and evaluate it. And, you know, I put together a little checklist here. You can pick it up, but I'll, I'll just give you the top line. The biggest question that you should be asking yourself and your boss should be asking his or herself is, does it ban mass surveillance or collection against U.S. persons? whether the mass surveillance or collection has been previously carried out pursuant to statute or executive order. And here's the pro tip. If someone says a bill permits one or more hops from the U.S. person target to other U.S. persons, that's still mass surveillance. That's the big thing to be looking out for here. And there's a list of other things you might want to be concerned about, but that's the big one. Yeah, and from our perspective, um, Really, we need to address the, the, the bulk collection of data. And, you know, obviously there's opportunities to do it in Section 215, but I think, um, as, as you mentioned, I think it's going to be more challenging there because it, it, if we end up with something that's watered down and it's unenforceable or, you know, the data is concealed and we don't know if we can enforce that, um, we're not getting anywhere. Um, so um, maybe the Surveillance State Repeal Act is, is a much cleaner approach and, and we're, you know, we're, we've endorsed that. We, we think it's, it's a good way to go. But as I said, anything that goes after this bulk data collection um, is, is good. And, and, you know, obviously it might make our lawsuit to go away, which would be cheaper for us, but, but it does get those protections back in the law. And the, the thing is that, you know, this bulk data collection, um, it, you're collecting a lot of data. And, and I, I mentioned this earlier, Friedrich Hayek, a, a famous uh, free market economist, criticized the Soviet Union for trying to control prices because they had all these price controls that they set up. And, and the centralized government was trying to plan thousands and thousands of prices across the, and, and obviously they failed. There's either be shortages or, or, or surpluses because they could never get those markets right. And the reason was Hayek said, because you don't have the man on the spot. That's where you get the information. That's what makes these, you know, the guys that are in the field and see that, that markets are failing, so there's an opportunity to do something and, and re-equilibrate the market. And you have the same thing going on in this bulk data collection. You've got billions and billions of pieces of data coming through, uh, you know, Washington, and they're trying to sift through this information. And again, you have this centralized, uh, you know, entity looking through all of these records, but there's no man on the spot. There's no way to sort of narrow that down. So maybe, and, and you've been in the CIA, so maybe if you talk about the human intelligence factor, in, in some ways this bulk data collection is harming our, our collection services because we're focusing on the wrong thing. I think that man on the spot information helps us. It's far more accurate, and it's something you can get a warrant for. It's, it's very accurate. So you don't restrict the, the security of the United States by going after this bulk data collection. I think you make it more efficient, more streamlined, and more effective. Nathan, let me, let me add a little bit to this, and that's that, uh, and, and this is true, by the way, of a lot of uh, surveillance and a lot of aspects of interception and, and, and uh, uh, storage of electronic communications uh, in other contexts. But, but what they really, you know, you, this always gets framed to you as preventing something bad from happening. The fact is, the way they are really used in virtually every case 
is that something bad has happened, and isn't it nice that we have this big database of stuff that we can query, you know, that we can type in search terms and look at later, maybe months later, maybe years later. Isn't that handy? Well, you know, this, we're not here for, to be handy to the NSA. That is not a conservative notion. The idea that we are to, around to make our government, or we have set things up to make our government agencies happier, is perverse, and we should reject it. Let me just uh, very quickly follow up on that great point that Mike just made. Mass surveillance did not stop the shoe bomber. It did not stop the underwear bomber. It did not stop the Fort Hood shooter. It did not stop the Boston Marathon bombers. Mass surveillance will not stop the next attack, the, the, the fifth one after that, the tenth one after that. That's the reality of this. And the other perverse thing is, is that our tax dollars are being used not just to collect all this stuff on us, but they're building this monstrous facility out in Bluffdale, Utah, to store the personal data of all of us that's of no value in any kind of, of counterterrorism or foreign intelligence scenario. So that, to me, is another very conservative reason uh, to, rever to reverse course here and to go in a very different direction, because we're spending a huge amount of money to store data that's totally worthless. So they went over sort of the how. Um, I'm going to keep talking about the why to do it. You know, so how many people here watched John Oliver's piece this week on the NSA? Raise your hand proudly. Raise your hand, please. <laughs> so if you did not, please go to YouTube and search for John Oliver NSA and watch it. It's the best, it'll be the best 30 minutes you'll spend. So one of the things, this is, goes into the why, one of the things he did was break it down for the American people. He interviewed people in Times Square, asked, asked them, do you know Edward Snowden? And, and there was mass confusion. They didn't know, a lot of people didn't know who he was, what he did. But he framed it in the context of, my mom is watching too. So yes, your mom is watching. You have to watch yeah. the video. Yeah, 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 yeah. Junk. Would you, how would Personal. you feel if the government had photos of your private parts? There you go. Snowden called it junk. John Oliver called it another thing. Yeah. Uh, starts with a D. So, <laughs> uh, so how would you feel? And so you saw in that video anger. You saw surprise. You saw a, a, a visceral reaction to that, right? And so I think you know some folks here remember the SOPA PIPA debate the SOPA debate on how many people contacted Congress that day, right? Uh, we also see uh, from the net neutrality open internet debate, there was over 4.3 million comments filed at the FCC. So as pieces like Oliver's piece comes out and, and explains it to the citizens, I think you're gonna see you know, a SOPA moment on this issue. So where are, you, where are your bosses gonna be when that comes, where do they vote? Are they just gonna scurry around at the last and, and say, well, someone's gonna die, I'm gonna vote for it? Or are they gonna think about it and have a debate? Because that, I feel like that day's coming, maybe not next month, but it's, it's coming as people really start to understand that photos of their, their junk are in the hands of the government. Uh, I, the, the video is rather uh, fascinating, um, and uh, I think it drives a point home. I, I, I think John Oliver did a great job in, in saying, you guys are, are, are involved in these issues daily, constituent mail, reading Google updates, your political pro subscription, Facebook debates, whatever. Um, the general public hasn't necessarily. Sometimes they associate this with the IT guy who smells like canned soup, to quote John Oliver. And I think what John Oliver did a great job of, and I think some of the other comedians have done a good job of, and, and some other outlets like Reason.com have done a good job, and I hope that we can do a better job of this, is actually explain how it relates to the American people, where they are. Um, and you know, I think as that grows, constituents are going to be calling more and more about this. Uh, and Mike. Let me add one thing uh, that's worth noting, and that's that uh, uh, today uh, uh, EFF, with the support of other organizations, including R Street, is going to facilitate uh, calls to your bosses about Section 215 reform. Uh, you'll see it on the, on the EFF.org uh, website. That's going to happen. Um, the other thing, and, and so be alert to that. I go look at it when you have a chance, but but don't do it on your phone right now because we still want to be heard. Uh, but 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 I the other thing I think that's worth pointing out is that one of the answers, and it's a subtle but and tricky answer that you'll hear, is they'll say, well, we're only or most of the time we're only collecting call records. We're not really capturing uh, pictures of your junk. We're only capturing the fact that you talked about having a picture of your junk. 
to be honest, we don't need, we don't need to see the picture to already feel that that's invasive. <laughs> Uh, and the fact is that, uh, and, and as uh, a former uh, NSA uh, general counsel, Stuart Baker has said quite ha expressly, when we have the call record data, we really don't, we, we rarely if ever need the content. We know everything about you. One thing I'm going to ask real quickly, we were going to take, I think, one more question, and then we'll open up to the audience. And I have a list of laundry list of questions, so you can stay as long as you want and talk about this. Um, and we'd be happy to. Um, but uh, I, I recently had a couple, I've had a couple conversations with individuals within the intelligence community who will be renamed nameless, um, who have talked about the fact that they like, it, it's kind of known, Michael Hayden's talked about this in public, and James Clapper has alluded to this too in his statements. There seems to be this, this idea that, that the intelligence community likes the appearance of congressional oversight, but they don't actually want congressional oversight. We see that a number of the rank and file members of Congress have actually very limited access to the confidential information that's available. Um, their staff are not qualified regularly to get the confidential data that, that they need. Uh, a lot of the talking points come from leadership and, and the intel standing intelligence committees at the House and the Senate. Does that have to change in order to have congressional Congress to have a real oversight, or should we just accept it as the way it is? No, I think you know one of the things that was a frustration constantly to my boss, and, and he served on House Intel for eight years, was what he referred to as quote the game of twenty questions, right? So if you if you didn't ask exactly the right question, you would you would get a particular answer. Now. When he was the director of NSA, General Alexander made the mistake of, of playing that game with my then boss uh, during a visit that Mr. Holt made to NSA in December 2005. You can find this online, you know, just Google Rush Holt, Keith Alexander letter. Um, he asked General Alexander point blank, are you all collecting data on millions of Americans? Are you spying on Americans? General Alexander looked him in the eye and said, no, sir, we don't do that. Seven days later, Jim Risen's first story at the New York Times on the Stellar Wind program runs. To, the, to my dying day, I will never forget my boss standing over my shoulder, verbally, almost at the top of his lungs, dictating the letter to Alexander absolutely frying him for lying to his face about the, the very existence of the program and what it was actually doing to the public. And that's why I cannot emphasize to you nearly strongly enough, have your bosses demand access to this data from the committee. I, I will tell you, I don't believe that the committee should have rules that require a vote for member access on, on these kinds of programs. If it's covert action, that's covered by a separate statute. There's no reason that each and every member of the House should not have direct access to information on this program so that he or she can make their own determination. And the second thing, and this needs to change in the rules of the House too, every one of you in this room should be TSSCI cleared so you can see the data, so you can give your boss your best advice and your best counsel, so that you can also talk to other attorneys who are TSSCI cleared to really get the scoop on these programs and what they can and they cannot do. That's another change that really does need to happen. Great. Um, why don't we take a couple questions? If there's any questions in the audience, um, we'd love to have you share. I'm looking at certain staffers who I asked to ask questions. That's a joke. Yes. Well, so uh, I know for Salesforce was in the news where one of their one of their their biggest customers pulled out and said, "Hey, we don't want our data in the United States." So they lost that customer. That's one of the more public ones. Um, you know, some of this is you know going to conferences and talking to, to companies that are doing <coughs> business. You know, it's probably not public news, but seeing um, basically how they position themselves. Even um, you know, one of the in Europe. They, ha they have one of the, the, it's considered the biggest cloud conference called World Hosting Days, right? 
And so who was their keynote speaker this year? Edward Snowden, right? They're saying, hey, host your stuff in Germany, it's private. So I don't have more specific examples. I can just tell how, who I'm talking to and, the, and really how they're positioning uh, their products vis-a-vis -vis American products. And it's uh, very intentional. But they're also doing things, I think, fundamentally. For example, I keep coming back to Germany, and Switzerland's a good example, too. Because uh, in Switzerland, privacy is baked into the con Constitution as a constitutional right. But in Germany, they're pushing into an encryption for email, for messaging. This is coming from the government. And so it's like, why? I mean, obviously, there's a, um, it's good for business, obviously, as I've talked about. But I think that the Germans have seen the heart of the beast. They've seen when the government has too much information on its citizens. They are concerned that the you know, Snowden allegations have them concerned. So they're pushing for that to protect their citizens as well. And it's coming how they really kind of changed their culture in, in a lot of ways. Um, so there's evidence of that. And so again, where are we going? Uh, we're going towards Germany or we're going towards China? And what's the business impact? I, if I could do a follow-up. Yeah. Um, so can you explain, sorry, I'm off again. Could you explain um, how a individual company, why they would care so much if they were, you know, uh, surveillance? What would be their specific business interest that would discourage the surveillance of the surveillance? Well, so, uh, gaining customers, if your customers don't trust you and don't trust the, um, the, the government laws you're under, under then they're not going to trust their data with you because uh, I think more than consumers, businesses treat their data as their personal property, not just some, some metadata about them. They treat it as their property. So they think about where's my property going. Uh, I wish more consumers viewed their data as their property, and you know that's another discussion. So they're really uh, looking a little bit harder about where where they're going to put their property. So it makes that people make those decisions. We make those decisions too as a company where we're going to put servers. Who are we going to tr you know who do we trust? Um, and so people are. I think companies are making those decisions all the time. I think that obviously the Snowden uh, event really force that hand a little bit, but force people to look even more closely, I think, to where they're, they're, they're keeping their data. So talk to John Chambers, the CEO of Cisco. Ask him how much business he's lost. That's right. He wrote a letter to Obama last year. I don't even know if Obama ever responded to it. Um, complaining about the NSA personnel, and this is in Greenwald's book. These are the photographs in Greenwald's book. They've got boxes of Cisco routers. They're cracking them open. They're putting implants in there. If, if you are, have been a client of Cisco and you see this kind of stuff, this kind of supply chain interdiction going on, and the U.S. government compromising these products, are you going to buy stuff from Cisco? You know, I, I mean, that's, that's like a, a, a knife in the back. I mean, you have a federal agency basically cutting the throat of an American company. Yeah, and, and, and that brings up my point about us, are we being more like China? So Huawei which is the Chinese version of Cisco. 60 Minutes had a big report on that four or five years ago about how we don't want any Huawei because there's back doors for the Chinese. Well, that's what people say about Cisco now. So again, where are we going here? People are looking at as we're losing our lead here. Um, so Cisco is, a, is another great example. I, I, I think a way that that time, time ties in um, also is we used to think of Silicon Valley and maybe Austin, Texas is where the tech hubs were. But over the past few years, we've seen this growth over across the country in various districts across the country, whether it's Grand Rapids, my home district, or Detroit, or some other cities that try to be the new tech hub, that try to be the new Silicon Valley. That's going to be cut a little bit if you're having companies like Cisco and other large companies actually fighting against this. Um, if it's going to affect the big companies, it's going to affect the small ones as well. And actually, R Street put out a report that's actually out there that we'll send in the follow-up that goes into kind of the economic um, um, uh, ramifications of, of, of the cloud being poisoned. Um, and if, we, if you'd like more information, we can get that. I think I had a question in the back. Is that correct? Hi, Baron. So, 
uh, there's been some numbers out there, man. There's a the, the the document you guys put together and 35 to 180 billion dollars of lost business, you know, billion here, billion there. It, kind of my eyes glaze over a little bit, but I think some of the the impact is what you were talking about. You know, today you can have a company in Grand Rapids. You know, all, a lot most companies are not in Silicon Valley or Austin, right? So that are online, you can have a company and service customers globally, right? You can, people can buy your services. We're a good example of that. I mean, we have customers in every country in the world. So are we going to become more where people won't buy from us? Like in China, they basically, is they, no, here, we all probably wearing shoes from China, iPhones made in China. But has anyone here really bought an online service from the Chinese? Probably not, right? Because they just make services for themselves because they're very cloistered and closed in. So they get, there's WhatsApp and they create something called WeChat, right? And so are we going to be like that? It's not, you know, not going to happen overnight, but are we heading in that direction? So we're, we're the, the next cool services are made outside the United States and we have to rebrand it and call it red, white, and blue or something. I, I don't know, you know, <laughs> what we call it, but um, that's, I just keep wanting to making that point. That's the threat that you can't operate globally or have a global business in the United States because people don't trust us and we lost that moral high ground. And I'd like to add just one thing on that is if we do have this moral high ground where we are producing the, the internet that people want that provides the provi privacy and all the other uh, va valued aspects of using the internet that people want, that's, that's a direction that I think leads to economic growth and, and actually personal freedoms. Um, on the other side of this, a lot of times when, when, when you've got the government sharing this information, um, it's not just our government. Most of these governments will start to enter into reciprocities with one another, and then you get inf information sharing across the borders. And I think that's the worst of all worlds, where it's not just the United States doing these things, mm. but it's every single country in agreement. So that data is not protected anywhere in the world. Yes, in the back. Uh, over here, then I'll go to you, yeah. I did not ask her to ask that, so just, just, <laughs> just, just to be clear on that point. Um, yeah, if you, if you take a look at uh, the Polk and Massey bill, it has the strongest whistleblower protections, I would argue, that have ever been proposed. Um, now, why do we need to worry about this? I'm, for a minute, I'm going to set aside Edward Snowden, right? A decade before Edward Snowden, there were a group of incredibly dedicated crypto mathematicians at the National Security Agency who developed a very, very low cost, extremely Fourth Amendment compliant program that could collect, analyze, and disseminate signals intelligence without violating the privacy or the Fourth Amendment rights of a single American citizen. Why haven't you heard about that? Probably because that program was killed by Michael Hayden a year before 9-11 in favor of what became a massive, massive Beltway boondoggle called Trailblazer. In the Washington Examiner's April 13th issue, I will have a very long piece that's gonna talk about that particular program, that whole controversy. But the long and the short of it is this. The individuals that were involved in putting that program together were so disturbed by the waste, fraud, and abuse of the Trailblazer program and the missed opportunity that ThinThread represented that they brought their case up here to Capitol Hill to the House Intelligence Committee. An Intelligence Committee staffer on the Republican side by the name of Diane Rourke was so outraged by the story that she went to the then chairman, Porter Goss, also a former serving officer at the Central Intelligence Agency, and told him that the committee needed to act on this. This kind of waste, fraud, and abuse had to end, and a critical intelligence program was not coming online because of it. He refused to act. That put Diane Rourke and those NSA employees in the unique position of having to make a decision either to let it go, which their consciences would not permit them to do, or to turn around and file their own Department of Defense Inspector General complaint, which they did. I am one of the few people in this town outside of folks at NSA or the DODIG who's actually read the full classified version of that report. All I'm gonna tell you right now in order to make sure that I don't get prosecuted 
is that it validates every single claim that they made. Your bosses should demand to get that report and every other report on Trailblazer and Thin Thread and read those before making any votes as well. Because there was a program that had, had it been operational prior to 9-11, would have uncovered every one of those hijackers. And the attack would never have been able to take place in the first place. That's why whistleblowers matter. That's why Congress needs to, to, um, to, to embrace them, not to hold them at arm's length. Do yourself just one little exercise once you leave here. Go back to your desk. Go to the House Intelligence Committee website. I want you to look for the icon that says, want to report waste, fraud, and abuse? If you find that icon, my email address is pettington at cato.org. <laughs> I think you're going to be looking in vain. I get another question in the back, yeah. So this gets back to the, the, the general Keith Alexander quote, collected all mentality, right? And it was kind of the famous quote that ultimately came out about his directive to literally collect and vacuum everything up. So there's a fundamental difference, and, and this is where NSA as an institution has gone completely off the rails. There's a fundamental difference in terms of going against the guarded codes of a Russia or a China or a North Korea or an Iran, right? We want our government doing that. We want NSA doing that. That's how you prevent another Pearl Harbor. That's how you prevent other forms of, of kind of conventional military surprise. The problem we have is that right now our executive branch folks are treating the internet which all of us use to communicate with each other, to conduct our online banking, all the rest of that, they're treating it as just another intelligence target. That's the problem. It's not just another intelligence target. It's the foundation of the global economy right now. Maybe as much as two trillion in business online in, in 2016, if some of the estimates I've read are accurate. And if we want that to continue and to grow, if we want it to be an engine for economic growth and opportunity for entrepreneurs like our friends at Golden Frog and elsewhere, if we want to be able to continue to share our data with our loved ones and our friends and our colleagues in safety and security, then the path forward is not mass surveillance. The path forward is mass encryption and mass security. Well, and I want to follow on a little bit with that. Um, you know, I think the the NSA needs a little skin in the game too. Yes, that's their charge to maybe collect it all. But we've definitely seen they've broken the law when they, you know, spied on their spouses. And I forget the name of that, that program. But, you know, but there was no criminal penalties, so they couldn't even lose their job. So we need, if it's on my checklist, uh, is if they do break the law, there's a criminal penalty for it. And we need to push for that. So they have some skin in the game. Otherwise, it's the appearance of oversight um, the lip service, and we need to have th them have some skin in the game so we can let them, you know, think about what's going to happen to them and self-regulate themselves. That sounds great. Um, is, if there's one more question or so, um, otherwise I will move to the end. Thank you very much for your attendance um, and, and your interest in this issue. We'll be up here for a few more minutes if you'd like to chat privately or just quietly with uh, the, the, the panelists. Um, uh, one thing that's important is, uh, is before you guys go, you're going to hear a lot of rhetoric that um, is going to come at you from all sides. And uh, Patrick has been in the trenches at the CIA and in a very big part of the intelligence community. community. Um, Sunday has been in the trenches in the tech community and trying to, to build his company and, and go forward from there and actually facing the ramifications of the economic ramifications of these um, the, this mass surveillance. Uh, and Mike and, and Wayne have also done some great work as well. We are part of a larger network of groups on the left and the right who have been working together to push for real reform. And we have a lot of experts for a lot of different perspectives. So if we can be a, a helpful resource to you and your office, please let us know. We are always available. I bought lunch for you guys, so I'm more than happy to talk to you as long as you want. 
Um, and and we, we want to connect to you. We want to be a conduit to you to get the right information to make the informed decisions that you and your offices have to make, um, which is absolutely essential. Because again, we, we do not want to have the appearance of, of, of oversight. We want to have real oversight. We want to have uh, the, the surveillance programs actually within the Fourth Amendment and actually uh, following the law. Um, and, 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 you know, we didn't even touch FISA and we didn't even touch some of the other things going on. So that's a further conversation. We hope to have it in the future. And so thanks again and uh, we'll see you soon.